nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. This week's uh, topic is opportunities in nanotechnology. Uh, you guys know who I am already, uh, and uh, I wanted to introduce my colleague and let him say a few words about himself. Uh, his name is Tony D'Alessio, and he's from upstate New York. I mean, really upstate New York. So, Tony, why don't you just share a few words about yourself there? Hi. Um, I work at Erie Community College, Buffalo, New York area. Um, we're also having a great day. I'm looking out the window at the balcony. It's about 50 degrees right now. Um, so I'm, my background is electrical engineering. Um, I teach, used to teach in the electrical engineering technology department. And after attending the Penn state workshops, oh God, to 2014, I think, mm -hmm. uh, we started a program, got grant funding for a clean room that have been sort of running ever since. So. I'm going to start today's uh, today's opportunity session. Now, I'm going to talk about remind everybody uh, opportunities in nano uh, are, are out there, and that nano is all around us. You've seen this slide many, many times. Uh, I know that this slide. I remember when I got it. I got it at a, at a conference in Albany, New York, in 2009, uh, and uh, I, I said I had to have that slide because basically it said. And at that time, these were cutting edge stuff that was out there. Um, and, uh, and people have, I know people have been using this uh, quite a bit since then, but basically nano is all around us. And I would say to you right now, if you look around the room you're in, wherever you are, there's nanotechnology in that room. Uh, you know, you, you, can, you can basically challenge yourself to find nano in things that are around you. And I would guarantee that, um, actually I know it is because you're looking at a computer right now. You're looking at a phone or a computer. So I'm 100% sure that there's nanotechnology there, uh, but it might be in your shirts or your clothing or your um, or anything around you. There's tons of things that are out there with nanotechnology. And this is a great slide to introduce this to uh, into classrooms. So I did take a, a couple of moments this week uh, to kind of look at what some of the areas that we talked about in the first five sessions and created this little mural of, of where nanotechnology is. And you can see some of the things that we talked about this week. Um, and you remember we talked about diagnostics and in, in COVID testing and materials. I believe Peter shared about the materials in cars. Um, and that was just one example of the many areas. Uh, drug delivery. I know that um, Tarsh shared about drug delivery and as well as uh, Jared uh, talked about drug delivery. Um, and there, there was a question I know in the questions is, is, is COVID the only place where this stuff is going on in the app? So answer is absolutely not. We can talk about that later. It's all over the place uh, in drug delivery. Uh, textiles, the uh, hydrophobic clothing we talked about, basic research. Uh, I believe that Wes shared about this, um, talking about the SPM, in, but that's just one area. It's, uh, there's, it's all over the place. Household products, uh, all, all th through and through. Uh, environment, um, basically in, in uh, water, clean water, water filtration, uh, um, pollution remediation, whatever you want to think about uh, nanotechnologies being utilized. Energy, uh, both uh, both you know current energy sources as well as future energy sources, um, nanotechnology is wrapped throughout those those areas. Um, and then in microelectronics, uh, that was shared throughout uh, uh, the first sessions as well as uh, the subsequent sessions, and uh, you know moving into the future on quantum dots and so on like that. And then biomimicry, uh, basically looking at uh, nature and then actually copying it because we have the tools to be able to look at the uh, look at nature and be able to move things forward, like ketchup bottles that don't actually, you know, actually uh, um, have the ketchup stay, stay in the uh, in the bottle, uh, which is good for the environment too. So, okay. All right, so why your students should know this. Uh, you guys talked about this, if you remember, on the early, one of the first week's Jamboard. Mario led this discussion on why your students should know this. And you can remember, this is, this is what you people said 
Um, I, obviously, you came into the class with a lot of knowledge already, many of you. Um, some, I'm sure there was a whole distribution of knowledge coming in. But you can see I, I, I love a, a lot of these. Uh, it's in almost everything we make. There are jobs, 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 the wow effect, things that are out there. Uh, they want to prepare their students for the future. But I got to say the, the, the most the favorite one that I had uh, is the one that talked about it's the plastics of the 21st century. So other op the other reason we do this is basically it's out there. I mean, you know, this is the government's um, uh, the NNI uh, National Nanotechnology Initiative. Uh, you can actually, there's a, this is a great site here, nano.gov. Uh, it actually is pretty, got all kinds of nanotechnology resources. I didn't even know if we talked about this during this this uh, this this uh, workshop, but nano.gov is one I would definitely, uh, if you're interested in looking at resources and things, that's another place to go. But this is, I think it's a 2014 vision. Uh, the, you know, basically it's, it's, a future to which the ability to understand and control matter at the nanoscale uh, leads to a revolution in technology and industry that benefits society. And all these area, all these uh, alphabet agencies on the outside of this, that uh, circles this this slide. This is uh, actually at least Friedersdorf slide that she gave me many years ago. Uh, actually, all of them have national nanotechnology initiatives. And why do they have them? because they need to have them because it's the future, basically. They're all working in this area, and they do have an area, the area that the NN, NNI, uh, that is actually leading this, this umbrella organization for the, for the country. And it's the, the goals are we want to be, you know, basically leading the world in research and development. Uh, we want to turn that research and development into products, make stuff, and keep the economic engines of, of the country and the world moving. Uh, and then this is where, you know, you folks come in is the skilled resources. The skilled resources are the work is the workforce that we have that we're training to be able to be nano literate, if you will, at various levels. Uh, it could be at the, uh, you know, just the understanding and awareness and then it could be the people that are actually working directly in the field and i would submit that if you're working anywhere in technology or manufacturing or wherever it is you're going to be working with something at the nano scale be it the product you are making or the processes you're working on or the tool sets that you're that are coming into in into your area are going to be nano enhanced in some way as as time moves on moves along so um, and the, the other part of it is the infrastructure, the tool sets. You saw some of them in the fabrication and characterization uh, areas, plus all the other areas, the bottom up, top down, all the er other areas there um, in uh, the tool sets that are out there for nanotechnology um, are, you know, a raft in there. And then also the re wants to be what we want this to be done responsibly. We don't want any environmental health or safety issues. And we spend a lot of time on that in our uh, educational programs across the country, uh, making sure that people are aware of the potential issues and not doing taking any shortcuts uh, for themselves or for basically the, the community the, at large, which is basically everyone. Okay, uh, this is a slide that was created by, uh, I thought it was really cool, is actually, this is why we shared it, we could have shared a lot of different slides on where is nanotechnology going and how much, you know, how much money is it going. And this is, I'm not sure that everything on here is, is a fact it was done by high schoolers, okay? Uh, but they created this based on research and they went to this allied market research site and this is Mariel's students uh, came up with this. It looks like a couple years ago, 2018. Um, I think the cool thing is this graph on the right side saying where things are going. Basically, the cost of the technology is going to be going down and the, uh, the problems are going to be going down uh, and the adoption of nano is going to be going up. Uh, Self-powered devices are going up and government funding is going to be going up. If you look at this graph and look at the interpretation of this, these graphs and you could see some of the areas where they said nanotechnology was going to be growing this one, one website. So uh, Bob, uh, just just quick comment. Uh, you know, a nano drug, uh, you know, could be worth one or two billion dollar on its own. So I'm not sure you know, the two. Yeah, yeah. I, I I think these numbers are are very 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 uh, modest, if you will. So yeah. I think 
I think, yeah, yeah, I think right now, I think that, uh, you know, if you count it COVID rem remediation, think about the amount of money that's being made right now by the Pfizer's, Moderna's, and J&J's. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't buy the stock. I should have bought the stock. <laughs> <laughs> Last February. <laughs> Okay. You're right. So your, 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 your suggestion is that they are actually very, is it's, a very it's low. It's much bigger year. than that. It's much Absolutely. bigger than that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and there are, uh, there's, there's, there's all kinds of forecasts out there. This was done by a high school group, but I just wanted to, that's why I wanted to give the uh, references to where this came from. Okay. And this is a, probably a, a better predictor of where things are going. And this is by Mihail Rocco. Uh, who is one of the founders of the NNI. Uh, he's NS, works at the NSF. I think he's still there. Uh, by 2020, 70% uh, of all new advanced technology products will incorporate nanotechnology. I'm not sure how exactly you measure that, but um, that was the prediction by he, and he's been pretty prescient in, in some of the areas where he thinks, said things were going. Because, I mean, I think I met him in like 2005, and he was pretty impressive then and, and continued to be throughout the times that I've uh, been able to interact with this man. So, so as the, obviously as the market expands, the number of jobs needing different skills in nanotechnology will increase. Um, and it's essential that a sufficient supply of qualified workers be developed to fill that need. And I think one of the things I want to stress to people, and I think I said it in the first week, it's not just the future PhD scientists that we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about people all along the educational pathway. So don't just look to the student that is the future, you know, the top end of your classroom for the, the people that you, you want to be, become aware and, and explain the opportunities that are out there. Um, you know, we, we have people uh, that we've, taught that are within, and Terry, I should say, Terry and Oscar and our programs here that are definitely future PhDs or already PhDs. But we also have some that, you know, probably in, in past days would have been said, hey, we're just going to go, you know, we're going to find a place for this guy to go, guy or gal to go, but they're not necessarily going to be the top end of the academic pyramid. But there are jobs out there and there are careers out there for them in nanotechnology. So please don't ignore that group of people. I know you guys are here spending your time. You guys are the, those type of educators that are looking at the entire population of your classrooms. So and this is an example of that. I don't we're not going to show this because it's seven minutes long. So we're not going to go through a whole seven minute video here. But I really want to. This is done, I think, in the summer of 2015, and we did it for our NSF ATE Center, um, uh, the NAC Center. Uh, we went to, um, uh, we went to, uh, let's see, uh, Indiana, uh, Texas, and then we went out to Seattle. And actually, I believe Peter was out at, at Seattle at that time and is on this video. He has some outstanding comments on the, as a part of this video, and it's still very relevant today from a standpoint of, of um, you know, kind of what, what is said in here. And if you want to kind of get fired up about, you know, where, what are the opportunities are, we went to people who have gone through programs. Um, AT, they, were, they were actually educational programs at the ATE level or community college level uh, in these areas. Um, he, Peter was at North Seattle College at the time. We went to Northwest Vista and we went to Ivy Tech. And we actually talked to these people, uh, students who have graduated, uh, from the program uh, or or in the program, as well as alumni of the program, as well as um, educators like Peter at that time at, at uh, North Seattle. And then we also talked to uh, industry and talked about where the future is going. So it's a really good, I, good, um, I think it's a good use of seven minutes of your time if you have not looked at it yet. So workforce readiness, uh, one thing I wanted to, I did cover this earlier, and again, I was, I'm just trying to reinforce this this time, uh, is that we um, do, as part of our national center efforts, uh, we have created uh, international credentialing. And again, uh, some of the folks in this room, like Peter and Tony and others, have been a part of this creation of these standards that we created. What should we be teaching to students in um, in the uh, uh, four different areas of nanotechnology, and we broke them up into six different standards. Uh, so, if you are actually working in a university or community college, 
please do not start with, start with a blank sheet of paper. Uh, we have what should be taught based upon uh, industry, government, and educators across the country. And we work through an organization called ASTM International, which is, uh, again, it's an international standards organization. Uh, and we created uh, these six standards in health and safety, in uh, characterization, uh, pattern generation, infrastructure, material synthesis and processing, and material properties and effects of, scale, of size. And these are out there uh, for what should be taught within these programs uh, that you might be creating. And you might be creating just a characterization and you want to call it a nanotechnology characterization program. Perhaps you might want to look at the standard and see what's in the standard and then actually, uh, you know, teach to the, make sure you're teaching to the standard, uh, not just maybe what you're getting from one person or, you know, whatever. This is a collection of all of people across the country as to what, what should be taught when here. And it's, and the key to that is that what does industry want? You know, what do they want when people come out of programs? So, um, and what, right now we're in the process. Um, we're, we're kind of working at a glacial pace, but we're getting there. Uh, <laughs> we're creating certificates uh, in nanotechnology. We have created two, um, which are the health and safety and characterization certificates. And what these are, are certificates where a student who comes out of a program, say at Erie Community College, uh, where Tony is, uh, can test for the uh, characterization certificate and see how they did. You know, uh, wh wh what did they, you know, they can actually pay a, pay 50 bucks or whatever it is, um, take the test, and then they have this characterization um, certificate if they, if they pass the certificate. And what we are doing now is uh, creating the other two. Um, we're in the process of creating the fabrication and processing certificate, um, getting closer on that one. Um, and then we'll do the last one, materials, properties, effects of size. So what this, these certificates will do is uh, we want, we're going to, we want to get awareness uh, of these. We have some awareness already, but we want to get general awareness out there with the, the hiring agencies. So they know these folks exist that have these certificates. Um, and there, we have had some people who are already in industry say, I want to take that test, or I'm already an educator. I want to take that test, see how I do. So, that's a, so that might open some doors and opportunities uh, for, for me in the future. So it's, it's kind of one of those in the process of creating this infrastructure and we're in the, you know, if we build it, they will come um, stage to create some, some, uh, uh, some awareness around this. And again, some infrastructure for, uh, prevent it from becoming the wild west out uh, there in what people are teaching. Uh, and again, I, I just mentioned this, uh, hopefully they'll, they, they will, people will know that they've attained the knowledge once they get through these certificates, uh, the students that come out of these programs will really know their stuff. Uh, other, other areas uh, that are, other places that are creating uh, uh, not certificates, but micro-credentials. And we're talking about doing this in other areas, but um, Southwest, now it's called, it's not Systems for Micro, Center for Microsystem Education. Is that what it's called? It's Peter, the Support, or, support okay. Center for Micro, micro, micro Systems Education, I think. Okay. Yeah. It, they changed their name. Right. When they <laughs> became, a right, they became a resource center and changed it, I think, to Support Center. Thank you. Thank so you. they and kept the same acronym, right? So they they have they have some uh, some uh, digital badges, uh, basically micro credentials, if you will, or not not digital badges. I think they're micro credentials that you can earn. Um, they have a lot of online materials, uh, and um, these are the a couple of them that they have in MEMS fabrication, BioMEMS, and MEMS foundations. Uh, so, and there are these, and there's other examples of those across the country where you can uh, earn uh, micro credentials or badges in these areas. So, I'm just going to jump in for a second, Bob. Go ahead, please. Yeah, just to let everybody know, we're going to delve into micro credentials, and there's differences between workforce micro credentials and academic micro credentials. So we're going to get to this later. So we'll cover it in depth, sure. probably exhaustively. So um, we'll get to it. If you're not sure what micro credentials are, we will be getting to it today. Fantastic. Thanks, Tony. A couple of minutes, actually.
All right. So uh, the other thing I want to tell you is that the value of, of uh, you know, having these degrees uh, and this is we just did this as a snapshot from our uh, we try to figure out where our students are going from our 18 credit capstone semester that we do in Pennsylvania. And some of these students may have been Randy's uh, from uh, from a way back when uh, where they went to work uh, over time. Uh, and we uh, the uh, we did some sur a couple of surveys on this. Uh, and then we now we get you know, we try to get the students when they leave. Uh, they may leave our area and then go get a job somewhere or they go on for two or two years or six more years of schooling. And we try to figure out where they went. Um, but uh, these are the companies where they or I should say institutions where they went because they could be companies, government organizations, uh, could be educate educational institutions and so on. Um, and uh, of the people that we've had, these are this is the the uh, eye chart of where they went to work. Uh, and the 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 commonality of this of this is there is no commonality uh, is that they these guys go to all all different types of industry sectors, and they work in all different areas. Uh, and one of the criteria for getting on this list is, yes, they're doing work with some of the stuff that they learned in the, um, in the capstone semester here at Penn State, that that was a value to them to be in this job, and the work they're doing is working in this area, in this regime. So um, I think that's pretty. That's a pretty nice list of folks, and it's a nice... Uh, uh, just shows the value of this. And again, this has been going on for quite a while, uh, the creation of these. I know we we started this at least, I think, in 2004, uh, you know, and a little bit before that. We had about eight companies on before that. Now we've got, I think, 170 companies. So, and this is, a, we did this survey, I think it was eight or nine years ago uh, of folks. And this is some of the entree level job descriptions just the other day, somebody asked, like, what is the job title for, you know, people who are getting out with, you know, nano degrees? And the answer is, you name it, they're all over the place. People are not calling their people that come into their workforce nano engineering technicians or nanotechs or anything like that. They're calling them. You know, there are a couple micro nano things. There's a microfabrication tech, nanobiotech. There's a couple there in the center column. But most of them are kind of their standard Name. So this is the kind of things people say, what should I look for? Well, that's a really great question. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're the job titles are all over the map. I, that was back again, eight or nine years ago, but I believe it's similar today. I don't think people are calling them their, their workers, um, nanotechnicians, or there's very few that are calling them that. That was a point that I just wanted to make. If you say, oh, I want to went out there, make sure that what, what are the opportunities for my students? There are, they'll be in many different areas. I'm going to turn the reins over now to uh, Tony, who's going to talk a little bit about opportunities for the classroom. So we have some highlighted resources for K through 12 um, from Joyce Palmer Allen. She's somebody you've dealt with more than. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more yeah. about this. This is this is as you can see the date on this. This is uh, July, January 30th, 31st, 2014. Joyce worked at that time. Uh, as you can see, as the assistant education coordinator for the NNC, uh, NNIN, uh, which is a group of uh, universities across the country. Uh, she worked with Nancy Healy there and a couple of other fine people. Um, and uh, we got her to, she's actually a former high school teacher, master teacher in physics from Georgia. Um, she teaches a basically any kind of secondary science. Um, and she's actually taught middle school too. Uh, but she created this resource list, and it's kind of interesting. I think Renee was here when we, we created this, and we said, "Oh, we want we for our webinars, we like to create like a handout of kind of resources the, to be able to uh, share with folks that are you know attending this 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 webinar." And so, if we're, I was most of the handouts we got were like maybe one page, sometimes two pages, you know, basically double-sided. If you go here, she created an A to Z list of 14 pages of material. So if you have not looked at this resource list, I would highly recommend you take a look at this, uh, this list uh, that's in our, our um, 
uh, resources from this website. And I, I wanted to make sure you folks did see that. I wanted to highlight that because it is an outstanding resource for um, for folks to take a look at. And you can then link go out to links. I'm not going to guarantee that every link that's there is still working, uh, but there are there are great there are great resources there. So. Go ahead, Tony. There's there's lots of of good information there, videos, things you can show your class, things you can give as assignments. Um, it's it's fantastic, and they're 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 geared for K through 12, so it, it's good stuff. And then Mariel has her <laughs> her favorites um, that she developed, and there's a, a PDF link there. I just, you know, there's, there's activities, there's, you know, based on topic, there's, there's a lot of good stuff here. Yeah. It's, it's um, fabrication. It's everything we went through during this workshop. You can right. kind of supplement with, with these resources that are here. And it really is a part of the things that she teaches. These are the, a lot of the activities that she shares in her, uh, she's cold that she, uh, from, um, over the years that she's using within her workshops. And what's kind of funny about it is when we started this workshop, uh, uh, I don't know if she's Mariel's here today. She says, I wasn't aware of that handout of, of, uh, Joyce Joyce's. Yeah. And she says, Oh my God, that's a great resource. So she said, she's going to go back and see if there's any resources in there that she'd like to be able she she'll be putting into her, her, uh, classroom. So, so you're constantly learning there. So. One of the great right. things about these resources is these folks, Mariel and Joyce, have already sort of vetted them for you, right, to make sure that, that the level is appropriate. You know, one of the feedback we've gotten or I've gotten personally um, since I started doing Nano 14, 15 from local high schools that I worked with is, you know, one of their biggest challenges was finding appropriate level resources for their particular grade level, right? So these have already sort of been vetted for K through 12 or high school or whatever, right? So it, it saves you some time of going through them as an educator, right? So it's a great place to start without doing all the work yourself. And then um, here's a, a breakdown that recently came in from NanoHub. And I want to say Purdue, Bob. Am I wrong? We're, you are. You, know, you are absolutely correct. We, okay. We, we've been working with them. You have too, right? Right. I just, I always forget. I know they're in Indiana somewhere. Right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is one that Renee and I and, and Oscar, I think we're talking to um, uh, NanoHub. Uh, this is a recreation of something that was done by NNCI. Um, uh well, actually, N and I N by Joyce and and um, um, Nancy Healy, uh, they created a matrix that was on the N and I N and I N site, and I always thought it was fabulous. And and then when anyone N and I N went away, it kind of went into disrepair. Uh, and actually, um, Joe from um, I don't ask me to pronounce his last name. Uh, Joe actually. Um, uh, shared it with us a couple of weeks ago, and I asked him if it was okay to share this with this group because it's really a work in progress. He's taking the some of the NNIN and NNCI stuff and putting it into a matrix. And let me show you that matrix here, which I think could be very, very valuable. You're just looking for an exercise, um, and he calls it a bingo card. I just I call it a matrix, but you know, you want to uh, you are a, a high school bio or a middle school biology teacher and you want to find uh, something for your classroom to work in nano, uh, you'll look at here and you'll see eight different things that have been created. And they've been created. The, the cool thing about this is that they were created by educators. Uh, a lot of them were created in RETs that NNIN or NNCI have been running across the country for many, many years. So there are people like you who are kind of the three and four sigma teachers that want to uh, you know, want to want to really bring things into their classrooms. Um, so uh, you can kind of pick any area you want to on that on that chart and be able to um, to actually uh, find something, uh, find activities for your classroom, or then take them and modify them for yourselves. So the key is that so you I me. Mean, I thought this was a great matrix of 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 stuff that's out there for for folks. Uh, 
hopefully you guys will utilize it. And it's all the way up through, um, you know, the, and the, any undergrad, you know, uh, rates, uh, you know, 13 through 16, plus some things you might want to use out in the community. I shared this with uh, one of our partners um, down in at Norfolk State just last week because uh, he was doing some outreach. And I said, you really don't want to go with him. He didn't, wasn't aware of some of the resources was that were out there. Um, so uh, this is a great, I think it's a great resource. And, oh, thanks, Michelle. <laughs> She's been using this. This, uh, uh, this. Michelle, you want to say anything about it? No, I just, re I really like the lessons that are on this website. I find them super easy to use, helpful. Um, a lot of the things you don't need to have special materials for. And I was able to take a lot of the graphics and different things and put them into jam boards or make them, you know, virtually friendly. It was not too difficult to do, but this matrix is going to be so much easier to sort than trying to go to the website. Cause like if you hit the back button, it gets rid of your search and you have to kind of start all over again. Right. Right. It has a listing of by those areas, how many they classified in and, and he's uh, Joe's just using keywords that were put into each of these activities to be able to find, find them. And we're going to actually be doing something with some of our materials that we have. Uh, a lot of us are migrating a lot of our materials to a nano hub and we'll talk about those later. Yeah. Nano hub in the past was like drinking from a fire hose. You'd go on the site and there were just thousands <laughs> of things and they were not sorted. You know, you, you had to go through them to find what was appropriate for um, the group you were trying to educate. So they've been doing a really good job lately of um, making it more searchable and sortable. And the other thing I wanted to mention that Bob kind of threw it out there, but didn't really talk about it, was what an RET is. So he said mm -hmm. some of those were developed on RETs. We're going to talk about RETs later. But that's an opportunity. It's a program through the National Science Foundation called the Research Experience for Teachers, where research universities bring in K through 12 or community college teachers um, for a, typically a five week research experience over the summer. And then you have materials to present back in your classroom when you complete it. So we have some other um, ATE resources. That's the um, Advanced Technological Education Program from NSF um, on NanoHub. So um, there were a number of centers that were funded years ago. Um, that no longer exist, but their great work still exists. And those are the things we want to point out. So obviously, um, Penn State's network, the NAC network that we're a part of right now, we're placing things there. Matt Pyle at the University of New Mexico, that's his support center for microsystems education. So we had it, Bob. It was just two slides too late or three <laughs> slides too late, right? Um, is posting things there as well as their own website. Um, Neotech was the Northeast Advanced Technological Education Center, which at the time was at Hudson Valley, and now they're at SUNY Polytechnique. Um, they're posting there. NanoLink was at Dakota County Technical College in Minneapolis area, Minnesota. Um, Peter's old stomping grounds was um, shine up in Seattle. That was their NSF project. Um, and then there's just, you know, a plethora of um, resources there. So great. Um, and the other, well, the other thing I wanted to point out is that we have the uh, our resources, the NAC resources. Uh, we put a bunch of them there on, on and, and upgraded resources to the nano hub area and work with the folks at nano hub at Purdue. Uh, but we also have a bunch of resources on our nanoforme.org site, as well as the cnu.psu. So um, if you wanted a program in, you know, undergrad, a community college, nano workforce education, we have the whole thing available to you on our, right on our site and ready for you to go uh, to learn from at least. So. Right. I, I pulled out from some of the uh, activities, some of the things that are out there, people have had for text and resources. Uh, and they're at various levels. Um, you know, there's the, uh, the Ratner brothers or cousins. I don't know who they are. Maybe Terry knows, but it's a general introduction. The next big, big idea. We use that. We've used that text uh, within our work here. Um, 
uh, nanoscale activities uh, for a grade six to 12. I pulled this from, um, from Mariel's. Uh, she uses this, this resource. I, I've seen this book, it's an SDA book. Uh, it costs like three bucks or something like that. It's kind of crazy. Um, uh, Joyce Palmer uh, actually uh, really likes this book, The Big Ideas of Nanoscale Science and Engineering, uh, a guidebook for secondary teachers. And she's been using this for years. And it's really a good, good book from uh, basically um, saying, you know, some of the the you know facts about nano and some of the, the the legends that are not necessarily true and how things should be taught or things should not be taught. So I think it's a really good um, introductory uh, text for uh, for uh, uh, high school teachers. And then of course there's nanotechnology for dummies, uh, which when I first moved into this job, uh, Terry and Oscar insisted that I actually read this book because he said they, they said it was about my level. Um, you can laugh, Tony. It's okay. All right. I, I, I was, I was just <laughs> muted. Uh, and then Wes's book that we mentioned earlier, this really was, he really did come to the workshop. I wasn't kidding when I mentioned it earlier and said, what is the, you know, we're at the community technical college level. Where's the book on, on, on for the, for coursework at that level. And we said there really isn't one that's really that great. You're going to have to steal from here or steal from there. And, um, and he wrote it. So, uh, and I think, it's a, I think it's very good. It's very good from a standpoint of giving the basics for uh, coursework in, in nano uh, you know, technician level. And then uh, Deb Newberry just created a, a, a book called Nanotechnology Past and Present. So uh, that one I would uh, I, I, uh, encourage you to take a look at also. So, all right. So our very own rain network. Um, so these are remotely accessible instruments for nano that you can all access from your local site. Um, so we, as you can see by this list, there are, wow, this has grown a lot. Um, there are yeah. a lot of, um, there's, believe it or not, there are everything from high schools, community colleges to R1 research universities on this list, all making mm -hmm. their instruments available. So if we'll get to the list in a moment, but you know, these are obviously, if you look at the map, these are geographically spread out. So you can absolutely find folks in your time zone. Um, and you know, if you want to access something or you're running an event, um, you can arrange with more than one school to be on or to cover a time period if you would like. Um, everything from characterization equipment primarily to some fabrication equipment. Um, it, it really is a great community. Everybody shares their time and resources freely right now, um, which is fantastic. Um, Bob, when did you guys start this? Uh, well, officially, we, we actually started doing remote, maybe Terry remembers, I think it was 2008 or so when we started doing it. And actually, we were doing it to do work with our partners across Pennsylvania. We're located in the center of Pennsylvania. And to go down and we'll go to Philadelphia, where, where Randy is, it's about a three, three and a half hour drive. Uh, so we said, what can we do to bring some of this to classrooms in, you know, to do some recruitment? To folks uh, and so we would we started this and we had some very industrious people uh, bill mahoney i think was the first person who started working on this one of the people that works here now works at the nanofab uh and we created how can we make things remote and this is before zoom and before this other stuff so it was a hodgepodge of things and we started working on it um and then we uh we actually started going national in 2000 and 13. And then when we went out to Seattle, actually, we worked with uh, the group out there. I think that was 2015, I believe. Um, was that right, Peter? Do I have that right? 14, 15? Yeah, I think so. It was right after uh, we got our scanning electron microscope. Um, yeah. We wanted to be part of the network like right away. Yeah. So, so we became a, we became, that's when we actually started an actually national effort, if you will. Uh, and we started with uh, Erie and about six different institutions. And I believe we're now up to 26 or something. Now, not all of them are super, super active. 
some of them are there are kind of on the list in name only, if you will, you know, Oh yeah, they do a, something once a year or something, but yeah. usually if they're challenged, they're asked, they will help. They will help. Right. Out. And each of these schools has a limited number of tools that are available. I mean, so depending on, on the technology you're trying to access, it will limit how many are available. Um, here are some of the instruments, as you can see, scanning electron microscopes probably has the largest mm -hmm. um, number of instruments available. Um, AFMs are pretty good, atomic force microscopes at scanning force or scanning probe microscopes. Um, Wes talked about those. Um, surface profilers, we're adding a few more, I think. I think um, Nancy Luaji is adding hers. Um, I believe um, from Normandale Community College soon, so there'll be um, another one there. Um, spectrophotometers, optical microscopes. Um, so there's there's a lot of cool instruments here, and I just want to quickly mention because I'm going to talk about this in a little bit and some applications of it is the energy. Um, dispersive spectroscopy EDS that allows you to do an elemental analysis of a sample and we'll talk about that in a bit coming up cool um, so basically um, you, you go to the link um, on the slide um, you can choose a school fill out a form um, make a request to access an instrument um, if the site can handle your request um, they will set up um, sort of a preview with with you as an instructor to run you through the remote access pro access process and make sure everything is um, sort of smooth um, prior to your class activating it. And be aware that we are literally going to pass the control panel to your local computer. So whether it's you as an instructor or your students are literally going to take control of that instrument and you will be on a video link and there will be a technician available at the instrument. So if, if you get things, you know, way off kilter, you know, they'll, they'll bring it back in and pass it back to you. So um, this is a great way to give your students a little bit of hands on time on some expensive instruments. Great. Um, Bob, I'm just, I'm looking at the, uh, so I'm going to rely on some of you because my technicians sure. handle the, uh, the remote access. So there was a question in chat. Is it possible to share the screen to zoom? Um, yes, you're literally, we're going to pass control of our screen on the instrument to you. And you are going to control that instrument. During the um, remote access. Exactly. Right. Now, based on some of the feedback and i think eves is on this call um some of the instruments zoom doesn't work um people have found other applications whether it's teams or team viewer or some something else okay I just, i'm sorry eves i just saw your comment in the uh in the chat as well so there's you know it depending on the instrument really depends on on how you're going to access it not everything is zoom compatible is, is what we've been finding so i just want to make everybody aware of that but if you contact the school they'll work with you to make sure that if possible you can access that remotely um become a part of the mnt community there's the micro nanotech education special interest group um mntsig.net um we're always looking for new members we have a number of committees i think that's the next slide bob yep so if you want to join a working group you know we have a group for professional development we have a group working on curriculum at different levels a group working on outreach and recruitment we have a group on industry working with industry and a group on distance education um tony why don't you take on the high school yeah we've got opportunities for high schools so traditionally, you know, most people try to integrate, most teachers try to integrate it into earth science, chemistry, biophysics. Those are sort of the easy, low-hanging fruit. 
Um, you can do laboratories, po you know, are possible via remote access or a combination of in-class and remote, meaning you can have your class do something in a chemistry lab, for example, and then send, you know, things to be imaged or characterized to one of the range sites. And then we can actually show your students their results, like the following week or two weeks later or whatever. Um, so here in New York, we've got some high schools that actually have almost as much characterization equipment as we do. And they're actually doing things with their, their um, career and voc ed type programs rather than the, the college bound students. So they have a forensics program and, and we're back to the EDS thing. So, you know, it used to be years ago to do gunshot residue tests. They, they looked for nitrates. It was a simple test. Um, now they actually look at the chemical breakdown and, and I forget which it is. It's either antimony or bismuth that they look for to tell if it's, if it's gunshot residue. Um, there's a construction, construction and building trades program where they actually look for, you know, sulfur present in, you know, drywall or sheetrock. They, you know, if you remember about, I don't know, five, 10 years ago, there were a lot of construction materials coming in from China that were high in sulfur and they were outgassing in people's homes and, mm -hmm. and making them unlivable. So, um, you know, it's, it's a way to bring in sort of all these trades. Um, you know, they've, they've cut the ends off of end mills and a machining program and looked at the cutting edge, you know, of a new and a used bit to see what the differences are. Um, they had a beauty program. They actually had um, the women in the program yank a hair, put it under an SEM, look at it. And then each one was assigned a different hair care product. And then every week they pluck a hair and, and and look at it under an SEM. Um, so there's there's lots of, of, you know, sort of other ways you can introduce non-college bound students to the nano um, technology and, um, and just, you know, give them some exposure to it and how it might apply to their field. Um, so academic micro credentials, I'm gonna, I, I wish I had a little bit more time. I know we're, we're running short, but um, so almost, I, I shouldn't say almost every, um, here in the Northeast, most states have some form of advanced studies or early college, high school, the names vary, where um, high school students can take courses for college credit. Um, so it's possible that they can earn a, a micro credential in a technology area, whether it's from a local college or, or remote access from another region or another state. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, so, you know, in, in a college, you can add this into a course, you can add it as a module, you can add uh, multiple modules, you can add remote laboratories, um, you know, you can create courses and, and, you know, sorts of the traditional technology majors, electrical, mechanical, manufacturing, biotech, engineering science, the hard sciences. Um, there's lots of opportunities for that. There's lots of labs that have been created, lecture lectures that have been created you could use. Um, so I want to spend, a, I'll try and keep this to a minute or two, but um, more university systems are implementing a micro-credential policy. So I'm in New York, the State University in New York system. Um, a couple of years ago defined micro credentials as something being less than a one year certificate. So they can be between six and 23 credit hours of study. They can and should be stackable towards a registered certificate or degree program. They should be validated um, by industry. So industry should say, you know, if somebody had these two courses, we, we could hire them on an entry level job. And some of the first ones um, in New York State were actually culinary micro credentials, you know, a serve safe certification with some basic prep work. And they were getting hired, you know, to, to do basic prep at restaurants and supermarkets and things like that. Um, the nice thing is it only needs to be approved at the individual campus through traditional governance. So you do not need SUNY or state approval in our case um, for these. But the biggest benefit
is this award shows up on the student's transcript. So, you know, in the past, if a student took three courses and dropped out, there were three courses on their transcript. If they take three courses towards a micro credential, it will show that they completed a micro credential in that that topical area. So that's it's a bonus. It really is a big bonus for students. Um, so certificate programs, typically in most states, it's one year of study, 24 to 30 credit hours. And these are just some examples. I won't go through them all, but I tried to choose different types of programs in different states, right? Just to give you an idea, these tend to be based on whatever local industry needs. So we got MEMS in Ohio, microscopy in, in Utah, vacuum tech in Minnesota, et cetera. Um, so these are just examples of the types of one-year certificate programs that exist. Um, associate degrees, you know, I, I chose a few other different ones, again, in different states, different parts of the country. You know, depending on what's going on in your region um, is going to determine what type of program you should add. It's hard to justify building a new program if you have no industry in your area. You at least need it in your state before somebody's probably gonna approve a program. If anybody's got questions on any, any of the stuff near the end, contact me, contact Bob, contact anybody. Wes is here, he's got certificate and degree programs. Peter does, you know, any of us would be more than happy to answer questions if, if you're looking to integrate something at the college level.